Good morning, everyone. We'll get started here in just a moment. Good morning, my name is Shelly Goodwin. Shelley Goodwin. I'm with the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers. We wanna welcome you to this morning's land forum. Before we get started, we have just a couple of quick notes, whether this is your first time using GoToWebinar or a refresher. Just wanna give you a quick uh, overview on the control panel. You should have a panel that looks like this on your screen that you can open and close using this orange arrow key. You'll notice your microphone is muted because all of our attendees are in listen only mode today to make sure our panelists can uh, present without too many audio interferences. We are recording this morning's session and we will make it available to you in just a couple of days. If you're having trouble with your audio, you can go to the drop down menu right here and check your computer audio, or if you're still having trouble, you're welcome to call in by phone. When you click this button, you'll have call in information as well as a PIN number. Be sure to enter that PIN number when you use your phone to call in. Um, even though you are in listen only mode, we encourage your comments and your questions throughout the event, and we will be taking questions uh, for the panelists at the end of their presentations. Your questions can be entered in this panel right here, and we do have someone going through those throughout the webinar. And finally, you'll see one more drop down below this, and it is for handouts. And if you take a look at that, you'll see some additional information from our partners today, as well as a copy of today's agenda. If you have any questions for the staff, you can also send those to us through the questions or the chat box, and we'll be happy to help you as we're available. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Lee Lingo, Executive Director of the Shelby of the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers. Uh, thanks, Shelley. Uh, throw a shout out to Shelby County there. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, land forum series this year. Um, we're excited to bring this back for the fourth year uh, in partnership with Department of Ag and uh, Dr. Ryan Quarles and Tim Hughes, um, Kentucky Ag Development Fund, Warren Beeler. Uh, there's a lot of people that work very hard to put these together and uh, every year they seem to get to get better. Uh, this is, as I said, it was our fourth year. We have eight um, of the land forums this year. Each one is different. Um, Traditionally, these have been in person and have been wonderful uh, networking opportunities. Thanks to the state of the world and, and uh, the COVID pandemic, we're doing them virtually, at least for the time being. One particular benefit that that affords uh, attendees is that um, you can attend more than one. Um, the panelists are different in each of these. The conversations are different. The high points and uh, areas of interest are different. Uh, so. I, I speaking for myself, but I know we, we internally with staff have talked about this a lot. Every one of these is so different that we learn something new every time. So if you're available and can attend uh, subsequent uh, uh, land forums, I think you would benefit from it. You're going to learn about other ag folks, other manufacturing folks, and uh, it'll be worth your time. Before I introduce uh, Warren, I want to give you a little bit of information about manufacturing. Just realized my camera wasn't on. Sorry about that. Um, something that I, I think you all will understand, especially the ag folks, uh, there's a lot of trucks on the road. And every commercial truck on every road anywhere in the world is hauling one of two kinds of freight. Uh, they're either agricultural goods or manufactured goods. And if it's agriculture and it's going not going to be consumed in its original state, then that's going to uh, be delivered to somewhere where it's going to be processed. Um, and that's also part of the manufacturing process. Um, when you think about driving down the road and every truck you see is hauling freight that is ours or ag, that's a pretty heavy thing to be thinking about. 
Um, we are responsible between these two industries, uh, just about everything. Uh, everything you interact with from the minute you wake up till the minute you go to bed is either grown or, or put together or manufactured or created. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, and it wouldn't happen if it weren't for growers and it weren't for makers. Uh, so our industries are really inextricably linked and very, very important to our everyday life, uh, whether it's your cell phones or anything else, the food you eat. Uh, manufacturing in Kentucky represents $40 billion of uh, Kentucky's gross domestic product, uh, contributes significantly a uh, majority of the $30 billion in Kentucky exports. Uh, we are fourth in growth in manufacturing in the U.S. in the last 10 years. Uh, we've posted 18.5% growth in state against 11 point or 11% growth, uh, in manufacturing for the country. Uh, Kentucky is fifth in manufacturing production in the U.S. per capita. Uh, we're a small state, small population, but we hit well above our, our weight uh, class there. Uh, we have manufacturing jobs, uh, aplenty. We're responsible for 260,000 frontline jobs. Uh, target economic sectors is defined by the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development are general manufacturing, automotive, uh, aerospace, metals, primarily aluminum and steel, chemicals, plastics and rubber, food and beverage, distribution and logistics, and healthcare. Uh, last year, I said all but healthcare falls within manufacturing's realm and as the largest employer in the sector of the state, uh, we were one of the biggest consumers of healthcare, but with the pandemic, uh, many of our manufacturers have retasked their manufacturing capabilities to produce uh, PPE um, for uh, use during this uh, uh, pandemic. So we have folks that are making gowns and shields, uh, 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 the, not the masks. Um, it's been pretty impressive to see how manufacturers have answered the call for that. Um, all across the state. So I, I have to change sort of my uh, commentary there. Um, Kentucky's number three in automotive production in the U.S. Uh, we build the three most iconic and ubiquitous vehicles in the USA, uh, the Toyota Camry. Uh, around here, you can't throw a rock and not hit a Camry or bounce off to a Camry. Uh, the Ford Super Duty trucks, everyone can identify as the Ford truck by eyesight. Uh, and of course, uh, America's sports car, the Chevrolet Corvette. Um, we are the logistics hub of the U.S. with the UPS World Port, uh, World Port uh, D DHL's Air Hub, and soon we'll have Amazon's Air Freight Hub all located here in the Commonwealth. Uh, if you need to get something somewhere, this is the place to get it uh, started. Uh, of course, we are covered uh, from top to bottom in, in, in rail. Uh, we've got the Ohio and Mississippi River that we touch. Uh, so we can ship things by barge and we have more interstates than, you know, are, are easy to name. So trucking is, is very easy as well. Uh, without the logistics industry, commerce could not happen. Uh, our industry depends on theirs and theirs on ours. Uh, we're inextricably linked to each other's successes and struggles there. Um, the relationship is deeper than simply for higher services, though, in vertical structure. Uh, cutting horizontally across the base of industries and many others are the skilled trades upon which our businesses build their foundations. Uh, skilled trades are the elemental jobs, operational jobs that keep all of our doors open. Um, so everything from computer programmers to logistics, welders, uh, HVACR techs, uh, automation and robotics, uh, these are things that are becoming more and more prevalent across all industries, especially ours. Uh, those are just a few. Um, Last year, ADECO research estimated 31 million positions will be left vacant by 2020 due to baby boomer retirements. Uh, that was before the pandemic. And as we know, uh, through the stats that have been given pretty much daily by Dr. Stack and Dr. Fauci, boomers are targets for this uh, particular uh, uh, virus. So we have no idea what that effect is going to have on the boomer population and these tech skilled job uh, holders uh, in our overall economic outlook. Um, previously, you know, I wondered how we can, uh, with our economy being flat, how we could grow without people in these crucial conditions and uh, these crucial positions, rather. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about what this pandemic is going to do uh, on top of that, I think it, it we're going to see it's going to have some pretty significant ramifications. 
Um, we have a significant shared threat in our industries and in the growing talent gap. Uh, I know ag has similar problems. You know, your average age is, is pretty high in, in the ag and farming industry. It's similarly high in our skilled trades. And this is something that we have to pay attention to. Uh, we, we need our food supply. And, uh, you know, as we're talking about today, and Ryan likes to talk about, you know, growing parts, we need people going into the ag industry and carrying that ball forward, just like we do in manufacturing. So we need young, bright minds that are thinking about how to advance it. Uh, so, you know, speaking in terms of our, our industry, we don't have a, a demand problem. Uh, we have a supply problem. Uh, during the Great Recession, we used to have a talent pool. Then the economy corrected, and now, well, prior to uh, uh, COVID, we had historically low unemployment nationwide, and we no longer had a talent pool. We didn't even have talent puddles. We had talent damp spots. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like coming out of this, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, the population of the state is 4.4 million people. Uh, Matt will probably tell you that there are 8.8 .8 million barrels of bourbon uh, sitting in this state at any one time. So we have a, a two barrels to person uh, here as residents. Um, but an interesting fact, you know, when we're talking about jobs, uh, last year we had 130,000 open jobs in the state of Kentucky. We only had 24,000 active job seekers. Now that inevitably is changing with the COVID scenario uh, that's upon us. But when you look at how many jobs we have available, that's not accounting for jobs that will be available. That was the ones that were available right then that were looking for people. And we only had 24,000 people. So when I talk about a talent DAP spot, that is, that is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, we have got to find ways to promote our industries to get people interested in them. Um, so I, I'll wrap up just by saying, you know, I don't want to sound dire, but it, it's something that uh, our industries uh, need to consider uh, through these presentations. I've learned about so many innovative things that ag producers and growers and makers are doing uh, to really advance the industry. Uh, but we need new talent and new minds to make that happen um, for Kentucky to continue to be in the position it is at a strong economic position in comparison to our fellow states, we, we need that we need that growth. Uh, we need that talent pool to be thinking about what we do here and how we do it really well. So uh, that being said, I, I want to hand it off to Warren Beeler. He's a man that really doesn't need an introduction, but uh, we give him a little bit of one anyway. If, if you haven't already uh, seen Warren speak, you've been living under a rock somewhere or in a cave, uh, he is the uh, executive director for the governor's office of ag policy. Uh, he also has a lot to do with the Kentucky Agricultural Development Fund, which is one of our sponsors today. Thank you very much for that. Um, Kentucky Proud, uh, just so you know, I saw a Kentucky Proud sticker in Virginia uh, uh, on a window. So I thought that was pretty cool. Ryan talks about how significant and prolific the brand is, and I, I can validate that, that just happened to see it on a store window, and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, the Kentucky Ag Development Board, uh, as well as the Kentucky Agricultural Finance uh, Corporation, also areas that uh, Warren interfaces with uh, daily, and then, of course, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. So um, thank you very much for uh, all that you do to serve uh, the ag community and the Commonwealth of uh, Kentucky, uh, Warren, and I'll turn it over to you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Lee, and and I, I'm very appreciative of uh, of being part of this program. I'm very very impressive what uh, the scope of manufacturing, and I think the, the the relationship between in this land conference between manufacturing and agriculture is just basically absolutely magical uh, when it comes to it. I I've never sat in on one of these. I didn't think we had some projects and some ideas. Our uh, our office manages the tobacco settlement fund. And uh, that's been around almost 20 years, 18 years now. Uh, when they figured out cigarettes would kill you, everybody started suing the cigarette companies one at a time. The cigarette companies couldn't handle that. They said, if you put suing us, we'll pay. And 46 states took them up on it. Kentucky's the only state that had the right people in the right spot where we took the money and put half of it in healthcare and half of it in agriculture. And that's what we manage uh, over in our, our side of the deal. 
as we, uh, and I don't know how to operate this thing, Shelly, uh, from one time to the next, you may have to help me, but our, uh, our money over the years, we've, we've invested $626 million in agriculture and uh, agriculture has basically uh, uh, grown at Farmgate by about uh, 2 billion from 3.7 to 5.7. So it has made a huge difference. I mean, we're uh, helping farmers help themselves when it gets to them. Can you back up one slide for me, please? Um, there you go. And then uh, there should be another one hit in there. So uh, there you go. There it is. It, of the Ag Development Funds, here's here's how, and this is the reason I'm on this deal is that we've got money to help you know entrepreneurs and people to uh, get started ag businesses, whatever. Of the money that comes in this year, it'll be about 34 million dollars. Um, 35 percent of the money goes to the counties based on how much tobacco base you had in 19 Burley tobacco in '97. Two counties don't get any money, but now we've taken some state money and do it so. With the county money, we're talking about up to $5,000, 50-50 cost share. In other words, there's, there's not many things out there that you can't cost share in terms of, of improving uh, your farm in relationship to what it, whether it be genetics or fence or forages or, or technology or value added uh, equipment, anything, it, it comes down that part of it. So if you are not involved in what we call our Cape County and Ag Investment Program, you need to call your extension agent and get on the list and find out when they when they do that and, and uh, you'll have to take a test you got to you got to be got to be agriculture we also invested some money in in the youth we call it um, youth ag investment program where we can take part of that county money plug it in to help the help the young people uh, lee was talking about needing needing people i think the biggest need we have in agriculture 17 percent of the population works in agriculture and we need people more than anything else in doing it. And how you attract them, you get them involved when they're little. And then, but then we, be, we were able to keep them. Next generation is where we, we take the Cape money and put, put the young farmers in the front of the line. We can also do with county money, we can all do, do, do uh, regional and statewide projects. We've done uh, livestock pavilions at the fairgrounds there at, uh, in, the, in the individual counties. We've done farmers markets, those kind of things. We've also done, we got two feasibility studies going right now with multiple counties about broadband. We cannot farm anymore without broadband. And so we're looking at the possibility, how do we expand broadband? And we find out to a feasibility study, do that. So county money can be spent that. The state money is for regional or statewide projects. When it comes uh, to that part of it, probably the best one we've ever done is Hopkinsville Elevator, where an open cooperative of 3,500 farmers in 63 counties they own the elevator, they own the ethanol plant, and they own the company that sells you the inputs. Um, in, in 2017, I went to stockholders meeting. After grain sales, those farmers got back over $39 million. And I think that's what we look at. I've got a meeting going on on another Zoom that I got just got off of about our meat processing deal. We're trying to, how do we get farmers beyond the trailer gate? And the local food thing has taught us a lot there. We have on-farm on energy programs. I made three visits yesterday to dairies where we're buying compressors, we're buying vacuum pumps, we're buying fans, uh, anything to pay back in, uh, in 25 years um, with a third-party audit. You're eligible for $10,000 with a grant money. You got to spend 20,000 to get 10,000. We have on-farm water. On-farm water comes down to um, when you basically conserving water. Water is the most important ingredient we have in agriculture, we cannot survive plant, animal, whatever. The problem is we're using a lot of agriculture, using a lot of municipal water, city water, we call it. And in that situation, uh, if water gets tight, is somebody's house get water? We get, so how do we get agriculture to be off of city water and sustainable? Then we got the new meat processing investment program going on in another Zoom that I just got off of uh, there. And then we have ag finance, and I'll explain just a little more if we can we can go to the next slide, um, uh, Shelly. On farm energy, we just talked about pays back in 25 years. On farm water, what we've done is we did a greenhouse up in Greenup County, set of greenhouses. They were hauling water every day. We basically caught water off the rooftop, put it in a in a like a cistern underground tank. We recycled their existing hydroponic water. They saved 80 percent of the water that that's amazing the new newest thing we've got the virus has killed us 
the virus has killed us, has exposed our weaknesses in terms of, particularly on the processing side. The commissioner and I have fought and fought to keep these processing plants open. And um, but what we've got a situation where it, outside of uh, of those big processors, our little processors went from two months backed up to six to eight months to a year backed up. So we put together a program where we're uh, we're trying to incentivize growth of meat processing in Kentucky. Uh, we got three levels in it. In level one, you basically establish a baseline on USDA processors. Anything over that baseline, hundred dollars for cattle. 50 for hogs, 25 for sheep, one for chicken. Uh, just basically an incentive program, a lot like what commissioners got over with Kentucky Proud and Restaurant Rewards or buy local now they call it. Level two is we'll do $37,500 of 75% of a project, $50,000 project, but you gotta be able to get more Kentucky animals through that plant. Level three, we were just talking about one over there where we're adding pen space to Marksbury. We're talking about in increasing the, um, the harvesting floor um go up to we go up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars 75 percent of the project that's a three hundred thirty three thousand dollar project ag finance is the cadillac and probably the legacy of of the deal we do participating loans we don't deal with you the farmer we deal with your lender your lender comes to us we can do 150 250 000, up to half the project with a cap of 250 unless it's processing then we can go higher but we will take a second position behind the primary lender with two and three quarter percent money. Two and three quarter, the three quarter percent goes to the lender to do the work, 2% comes back to us. We now have over 700 loans, $94 million in that program. We're getting back 800,000 to a million dollars a month to loan back out. We've got money in Frankfurt making money and helping farmers. And that's, that's, that's really rare. Uh, one more slide and I'll hush and turn over to commissioner, but um our contact information is um at that if you want to know anything about cape or, or any of our programs go to kyagpolicy.com that's our office number that's our email and we will get back to you i mean as, as quick as we can if if um if you need me you call my cell phone uh, i may be on it if i'm not i'll call you right back i'm i am a stickler for that uh our our deal is we live and die with projects. We live and die with, with projects that walk through the door. That's why I'm on here. I wanna help you help yourself if you're an entrepreneur. And uh, we may we may not have the situation, but what we've been around long enough now to know where to send you. So um, look us up if you don't mind. Uh, we're trying to, to get there. I'll, uh, at this time, we were, we're very fortunate in Kentucky, Commissioner Bag, it's, that's eat up with agriculture. And I mean, he loves it, he eats it, sleeps it, wants to learn about it. Um, and he's very, very passionate about it. He he loves agriculture and he loves being the commissioner of agriculture. And I can't begin to tell you how how wonderful that is. And we, he and I talk every day or every other day. Um, we, uh, uh, we're out to we're out to basically help, help agriculture grow and be better in the state. And I don't, I mean, there's no better, more wonderful thing than what he's done here, him and Tim have done with this land conference, where we're connecting manufacturing and agriculture. So, Commissioner, I'm proud of you. I appreciate you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner Ryan Corals. Thank you, Warren, and thank you, Lee. Appreciate uh, you all being part of the uh, land forums. Again, this is our fourth year, eight stops across Kentucky. Uh, we hope to resume in-person meetings across the state. I know we're running already about 10 minutes behind, so I'm just going to cut my remarks very, very short this morning. First off, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, which would be TAM, my department, uh, GOAP, uh, as well as those local participants uh, that are on the call today. You know, COVID-19 uh, is first and foremost a public health pandemic, and our frontline workers are keeping us safe. But it's no coincidence that agriculture has kept us fed. You know, most times with natural disasters, economic collapses, armed conflicts, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they're always followed by famines or food insecurity. And the resilience of Kentucky agriculture uh, continues to prove itself that we, again, we fight above our weight class, that we've kept people fed. There have been some short term um, supply chain issues, particularly with our meat processors, but Beeler explained the program we designed. But this shows you how strong agriculture is. If you look at manufacturing, uh, manufacturing is the only industry of Kentucky 
that has more employees in agriculture. So when you combine these two signature industries, a lot of times we may not know what's going on in our own back door. So that's the whole purpose of today's meeting is to hear stories uh, and also collaborate and ask questions that I'll just give you the, the best example Paul, uh, out there right now. A lot of the folks on the call are, are from the Nelson County Lincoln Trail area that uh, with the growth of the bourbon industry, uh, they need more corn and they need more stays. They need more barrels. And so that is a perfect example of how agriculture and manufacturing have linked together. And oftentimes we spend a lot of our time looking for markets outside of the United States for Kentucky farmers. Well, sometimes it's good to stop, hit the hit the pause button and look for markets within our state that may exist that we may not have been aware of in years past. You know, we have people growing hops now for the growing craft beer industry. Um, industrial hemp continues to be a, a curiosity uh, for a lot of folks. And I think that the textile purpose of hemp could be uh, quite interesting for a manufacturing state like Kentucky. And yes, we could end up growing parts for uh, structures and autom automobiles one day. There are a couple things, I'm going to list off about four or five things that really connect agriculture and manufacturing and makes it really special right now uh, in Kentucky. Number one, we have a strategic advantage with our with distribution. There's a reason why UPS, DHL, and now Amazon in Northern Kentucky chose Kentucky. Uh, we're within uh, one day's drive of two thirds of the population. So that's something that gives our state a strategic advantage compared to others. Uh, both manufacturing and agriculture are dependent upon inputs, and so it's very important for us to make sure that, that we have a steady supply. And again, COVID-19 has shown weaknesses and stress points on the uh, supply chain systems and manufacturing as well. We are both industries that are dependent upon an educated workforce, uh, whether you're um, working in Toyota or my hometown of Georgetown or whether you're working on our farm, we want to make sure we have educated uh, workers out there, especially when you start seeing farm machinery require technical expertise that our grandparents simply didn't have to have. It's so important that we work together. Uh, and the last thing I just want to mention is that we have something that, that no other state has as well, and that is an established reputation as a state that has high quality agriculture goods. When you travel outside Kentucky and you travel outside the United States, you say you're a Kentuckian, they ask you about three things. They ask you about Kentucky bourbon, they ask you about Kentucky racehorses, and they ask you about Colonel Sanders. And when you think about each one of those three, they're all agriculture products. And other states automatically are behind the eight ball when they're trying to sell themselves both domestically and internationally because they don't have such a strong identity attached to agriculture. That's something that we have. And we use the Kentucky Proud brand uh, to bring this home. Uh, we have 8,000 Kentucky Proud members. You're going to hear from several of them today. I'm excited about our panelists. Um, I, I'm a patron of a lot of, their, a lot of their products, but the Kentucky Proud brand, when we combine it with the manufacturing potential, could, uh, could ultimately be something that really puts a stamp of approval and pride in our workmanship. It, it doesn't just mean grown in Kentucky, it could also be me, mean manufactured in Kentucky, and that's something we can use. So today, I want to challenge our speakers. Um, uh, hopefully, I know it's tough sometimes with virtual formats to engage in conversations, but I'm going to wrap up here and say thank you once again for CAM and our partnership in my office for, for a fourth year in a row. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Tim Hughes. Tim Hughes has been helping work with these land forums since day one. He also covers economic development and international trade for my office, and he's going to introduce our panelists. Tim Hughes. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you so much for the introduction. and. Uh, we do appreciate everybody participating this morning. Uh, notice uh, from the list of attendees, we've got several people from many different sectors. And Shelly, if you can bring up poll number one, uh, we want to know uh, who is participating in these calls. And uh, as Shelly mentioned at the beginning, there is a chat and question feature. And so we ask that uh, first you complete the uh, online poll real quick. Uh, so we can see who is participating. And then uh, as you hear things from the presenters, uh, please uh, ask a question either through the question feature or through the chat feature. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible uh, under the format that we're working under. Uh, as we start uh, with our different speakers, I think you'll notice several common themes such as family, community, persistence, 
sustainability, stewardship, inter innovation, and the interconnectivity that was mentioned between manufacturing and agriculture. And so, Shelley, if the poll is completed, I'll show those results. And so we've got a good cross-section of uh, private sector and, and government. And so, uh, once again, we want to hear from the different panelists. Our first speaker this morning is Andy Bishop. Andy is a very diversified uh, producer, uh, comes from a finance background, uh, has cattle, hemp, and uh, poultry. And so, Andy, we'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. And thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. Um, as Tim said, my name is Andy Bishop. I uh, am owner and operator of Fairfield Farms. Um, we're a diversified operation. I, I guess one thing that would be unique uh, uh, about myself and about my family is really I would be considered a first generation farmer, uh, which is rare these days. Um, I was in ag lending for 13 years, uh, but grew up with a passion for agriculture. We had a few cows growing up, but nothing, nothing major. Um, through that ag lending experience, I, uh, I kind of grew my passion for farming and for agriculture and, and uh, decided to, uh, in 2007, to really kind of expand my operation. Uh, we started with cattle and we have about 100 mama cows now. Angus, we sell a lot of registered Angus bulls and seed stock. Uh, my kids, I have four children, so they're very involved with the cattle side of things. They love showing and uh, uh, showing the cattle at the county fairs and state fair. And uh, we try to keep them engaged in the farm uh, through the cattle, and that's been very beneficial for us. Um, outside of that, uh, in 2016, I branched out into the poultry sector uh, and signed a contract with the Egg Innovations. Uh, so we have 20,000 uh, laying hens. Um, they're sourced at a farm uh, that I've purchased over in Washington County. Um, those are organic pastured poultry. So they run on 50 acres of pasture during the day. Uh, we get anywhere from 15 to 18, 19,000 eggs a day. Egg Innovations is unique in that they sell those organic pastured eggs across the country. Uh, mainly most of ours go to Whole Foods. Um, and, and so that operation is unique in that we can employ outside individuals. But also, it wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the Kentucky Ag Finance Corporation and FSA and, and the partnership that they've uh, worked on through the banking industry uh, for low interest loans for young farmers such as myself. Um, and so to put it into perspective, that's uh, a, a seven figure uh, investment there that wouldn't be possible without the state of Kentucky and Ag Finance. And I'm just very thankful for that opportunity and allowed me to uh, to bring my kids into the operation on something that will sustain hopefully a pretty good cash flow for our family uh, for many generations to come. Egg Innovations is also looking at uh, expanding into the state of Kentucky with more uh, poultry facilities, but also a feed mill and processing center. And so that could be good for manufacturing in this state uh, for added jobs as well. And so as we continue to grow with with Egg Innovations and they grow in the state, I think there's many things that will come from that moving down. In 2019, I actually uh, ventured over into the hemp industry uh, and took a job with, uh, with a large hemp company in Paris, Kentucky, um, where I raised 340 acres of hemp, uh, oversaw 1,800 acres of outdoor hemp material. Um, and so with that, it kind of stemmed, and you'll hear from the other presenters, the guys that grow corn, uh, our bourbon manufacturers that take that corn and put it into the bottle. I actually decided to uh, to branch off with my hemp experience and my hemp knowledge and kind of create a Fairfield Farms label. And so we're selling CBD tinctures and salves right now uh, with our Fairfield Farms label on it as well. Um, that's certainly a unique experience in the hemp industry. Um, pretty excited what it, what it can do and what it will do once the uh, market figures itself out for hemp in the state of Kentucky. Uh, but I do feel like uh, it is a revenue stream for a lot of farmers to to help with the shortcomings, a shortcoming from tobacco and other industries that are kind of struggling at this moment. Uh, outside of that, I've been really involved in the Kentucky uh, uh, Beef Council and the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association. I serve as the Beef Council Chair. Uh, and so our job as the beef council is to promote beef uh, in any way possible. And I use my kids uh, to be able to do that on social media, Facebook and Instagram mainly. Um, 
but we, I'm really, really passionate about the beef industry and about people uh, consuming beef products and it's good for our state. Um, so we, I do my very best with the Beef Council to try to be involved in that. Um, within the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, uh, those ag development funds have, have, have been very beneficial with the, with the launch of Beef Solutions. Um, that's our Kentucky branded beef program for producers across the state to participate in. They can sell local beef to consumers on Kroger shelves, but also in other venues. Um, that's been a very, very successful program and, and it helped jumpstart uh, that program through the governor's office of ag policy, uh, those ag development funds that, that Warren spoke about. And we're just really thankful for Warren and, and Commissioner Quarles and what they've allowed uh, farmers to be able to access capital uh, throughout the state to help build some of these programs and some of these brands that, that we can utilize. Um, as I travel the country uh, through National Cattlemen's Association, uh, I realize how benef the benefits that we receive here in the state of Kentucky. Uh, many states are not so supportive of their farming operations and, and, and we can kind of boast that, hey, we have not only a branded beef program in our state, but we have a, a governor's office and a commissioner that realizes that funding at the farm gate is extremely important to uh, to be able to utilize our, our state's resources. And I'm just very thankful for that opportunity and, and can kind of carry that uh, message across the country as, as I go across the country. So I do feel that I'm a small farm and a very, very small farming operation, very diversified and, and hope to uh, uh, carry this on for many generations with, with my children and, and my grandchildren um, as they come up. So certainly thankful for the opportunity to speak to you guys today and, and just share a little bit about what we do here on uh, at Fairfield Farms. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate the comments and appreciate your leadership on behalf of the state. I believe you were scheduled to be in South Carolina today and uh, uh, one of the, uh, I guess, benefits of COVID, uh, you're here with us instead of uh, somewhere on the beach. And, uh, we're, Absolutely. We're I, was, uh, supposed to, I was uh, speaking at a Farm Bureau function in Hilton Head today, so I'm uh, I'm spending it on my back porch instead, but I'm certainly glad to be here. Thank you. And please, if anybody has questions for Andy, uh, send those to us through the question or chat feature. Uh, our next speaker is Allison Boone Porteous, and she is with Boone's Butcher Shop. And uh, if you've... Uh, participated in any of the uh, the TV programs in Louisville, you may have seen Allison uh, talking about uh, their business over the last few weeks. And she also serves as vice president of the Indiana Meat Packers and Processors Association. Uh, so we uh, we welcome your comments and your leadership on behalf of the uh, small processors around the state. Thanks, Allison. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, so. I'm a co-owner of Boone's Butcher Shop. Uh, this is a business that was started by my grandfather in 1946, so we are almost 75 years old. Um, so my brother, my parents, and I all um, own and operate this business. Um, we are fairly diversified for a um, meat processing business. We do offer USDA processing, so we work directly with farmers who want to um, sell their own beef pork, goat, lamb to customers. So farmers markets um, and other small stores, you'll see uh, where direct marketers have their products. You'll see our labels on there as the processor. We also provide custom processing. So um, if people sell freezer beef for their own freezers, for uh, other people's freezers, we provide that service as well. We have a um, fairly good size retail space, and that's probably the place where people know the most about us is from retail. We do a decent amount of, of advertising for that part of the business. We do some wholesale, not a ton, but we do some wholesale with um, some, some uh, you know, direct marketers. We maybe help them out. Um, and then we also do deer processing. So um, we, we kind of exist today in part because of the Kentucky Ag Development Fund in 2004, our facility completely burned to the ground, and I'm not sure that um, my dad would have chosen to stay in this industry had it not been for the Kentucky Ag Development Fund. They kind of came in and saved the day. I think he was very close to being um, ready to just kind of walk away from the business, which would have been a shame. And, you know, hindsight being 2020, 
seeing how much we've grown over the you know past you know 15 years it was obviously the right choice to uh, move forward but um, we'll always be grateful that the Kentucky Ag Development Fund existed and was there to help us um, during that time uh, and then in 2017 we expanded our business um, some more in Kentucky Ag Development Fund again helped with that um, we created some more freezer space we were kind of using our freezers here for both um, the USDA and custom processing storage and then also for our retail store we just we couldn't fit it all so um, cooler space same way so they helped us out with that um, so again it, it you know I really I truly don't think we would exist if it weren't for the Kentucky Ag Development Fund so um, it's been a great program for Kentucky um, so just to talk a little bit I feel like the you know it was talked about the um, COVID-19 impact um, and specifically weaknesses in um, processing meat processing so the last few months have been incredibly challenging um, they have been we've been busier than we've ever been before um, like Warren I think said you know we, we're not even taking slaughter appointments right now we're still just trying to figure out what our capacity is going to be for the rest of the year um, it's frustrating I think or it's frustrating for us it's frustrating for um, farmers we are just trying to figure out what the right answers are um, especially with beef processing we generally have a two to three week hang period for uh, beef carcasses in our coolers and over the last few months I think we've seen that two weeks is a long way away in terms of what can happen um, especially in a business like ours we've seen it across the country um, where COVID-19 has negatively impacted uh, meat processing plants so it's a it's still a concern for us um, and we're still kind of feeling our way through it to see you know how we're gonna come out on the other side there have been some positives you know in terms of um, what this has done for our business but also what it's done for agriculture I think COVID-19 has really reconnected people with where their food comes from um, a lot of farmers are getting so much more exposure in terms of being able to directly market their products um, you know freezer beef or just you know selling steaks and ground beef and uh, pork chops everything by the by the cut um, so I think we're gonna see that I, I, I hope that people will continue to remember that this is a um, you know instead of necessarily buying everything from your grocery store that there are farmers out there who can sell their products directly and you know it's a good way to support your farmers your local you know local businesses so um, I hope that that continues uh, the other thing is is we are able to uh, we've we're doing some pretty major investments in equipment here in hopes of you know increasing our capacity in the future Again, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like but um, that is the intent so we are hoping for you know bigger things to come well, thanks, Allison. I'm sure there will be some questions uh, later in the program for you. Uh, our next speaker is Aaron Redding. Aaron and I go back several years. At one time, we were both considered young farmers. Uh, he persisted, and uh, I got uh, soft and moved to Frankfurt and started with state government. But Aaron uh, operates uh, Homestead Family Farms, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share the space with uh, such a great lineup of uh, speakers and panelists. Um, I'm a partner in Homestead Family Farms, and Shelly, if you could hit the next slide, please. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm there in the, the left-hand picture with my, my wife, Ashley. I've also got uh, three children. Um, other partners in the farm include my sister, Anna, and then my parents, Mark and Barb Redding. Next slide. <clears throat> we've also got, um, we've got around 30 employees, um, several of which are siblings or in-laws. So uh, in spite of, uh, in spite of being, I guess, a, a, maybe a larger uh, row crop type farm, we're still very much a, a, a family farm and uh, appreciate uh, all the family involvement as well as all the other good folks that work with us. Next slide. 
and I'd be uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, if I didn't bring this up. Um, in addition to uh, the employees and, and and family members, I've got to give a shout out my my two uh, my two boys, Andrew and Adam. They're 14 and 11. They are uh, this year. They are they're planting their 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 first their very own soybean crop. So uh, um, you know, as farmers, I think. Uh, a lot of times we 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 think about the next generation coming along, and and I'm getting to witness that firsthand here this year. So very very proud of that. But um, next slide. Um, we are uh, again a row crop farming operation. Uh, we're headquartered in uh, Southern Nelson County at Howardstown, but uh, we farm uh, several counties here in the central Kentucky area. Another slide. It's kind of a different way of looking at it here by uh, by, by farm and, and uh, in this particular uh, map, we had things sorted out by uh, by crop. But um, so, so covering that distance is uh, uh, obviously provides some logistical challenges, but uh, from, a, from a risk management standpoint, it, it, uh, it it can be beneficial too, just in, in terms of uh, being able to spread out weather risk uh, across uh, that geography. Um, next slide. In 2020, we're, uh, we're raising all non-GMO corn, and I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, we also do single and double crop soybeans, and then uh, wheat but also rye and and malting barley and uh kind of tying that in with the uh with the corn as well uh, uh the, the focus of those crops is is really on our relationship with the uh, the distillery so Shelly, if you hit the next slide uh i think i think where we're located here we are blessed with uh tremendous opportunities to to market our crops um, the three uh, the three names there across the top. Uh, that's where the majority of our soybeans go. Uh, those facilities are are located along the Ohio River. I know, um, you know, that was mentioned earlier. I think by Lee, you know, we in Kentucky with with the the river systems and the uh, the terminal markets we have there on the river. We have uh, great opportunities to sell our soybeans, but what I what I really want to talk about too is, and you can see some of those names there on the bottom. Our our farm, our family has benefited tremendously from the relationships that we've built with the uh, with the bourbon distilleries over the years. And um, um, probably uh, about 20 years ago, I think, is when we started selling to the distilleries. It was a slow process, but um, but. Um, I guess at this point, virtually all of our corn and then a portion of the wheat. And now uh, with our with our focus on on trying to uh, establish uh, uh, locally grown rye and malting barley. Um, I just can't say enough about um, about the impact that, that the, the distilleries and, and the, the, the focus on bourbon and the, the growth in that market has, has had for us. Next slide. Um, it, it's, not, it's not just um, uh, you know, a shoe-in kind of a deal. It's not as easy as, uh, as just running to the elevator. Um, you know, there are certain uh, quality standards that need to be met. And uh, we've done a lot of things here at our farm to try and accommodate that um, in terms of uh, increased uh, drying capacity, uh, um, cleaning, uh, cleaning equipment, um, <coughs> excuse me, and additional storage. But um, in addition to all those, in addition to all those things, it's um, I think it's 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 a focus on 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 trying to meet that market and and being a, a reliable supplier. So um, we're we're grateful to have that opportunity. 
over time. Um, next slide. Just a, a couple shots there of our of our two uh, grain facilities. The top one being in Howardstown, and the, the bottom picture being in, in Springfield. But but uh, having those facilities with the uh, the drying and, and cleaning equipment that we that we have is has um, really helped us to be able to to to, to meet the the demands of the the bourbon folks and, and meet the specs that, that they like and um, you know I'm, I'm excited going forward because it it, it is a growing market and um, and there 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 is a recognition that um, a lot of the things that that they need beyond just corn can can maybe be sourced or supplied from from right here in central kentucky so we're glad to be part of that um next slide uh with that i'll uh i'll wrap up uh, my portion but again appreciate the opportunity to be on today karen thanks so much for your remarks and our next speaker was scheduled to be michael elder uh, with blend pack and bloomfield farms uh, that's a business in Nelson County uh, that really focuses on gluten-free products. And we we're really looking forward to their presentation, but uh, they had an issue that came up this morning and uh, we may try to get Michael and their company represented at a future land forum. Our next speaker is Jeremy Hinton with Hinton's Orchard and Farm Market. And I really appreciate Jeremy pinch hitting. Uh, we had Scotty Lee lined up uh, to be uh, presenter representing uh, specialty crops and, and that segment of agriculture and uh, a family issue came up uh, late last week and so he wasn't able to join us but jeremy is a recognized uh, farm leader in the community and around the state and we look forward to your remarks as well thank you tim um you hear me okay just want to make sure my my technology is working right um i appreciate the invitation tim and uh was was happy to step in and uh, take Scotty's place and spend a little time talking about our um, about our business and what we do here on our farm. Um, I know Andy mentioned being the first generation of uh, of his family to farm. I'm uh, blessed to be the eighth generation of my family on my mother's side to farm here in Larue County. Um, but certainly none of uh, none of the other generations are are doing quite have done quite. Uh, what we're doing in terms of the, the crops and the variety of things that we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, this is the main uh, force behind Hinton's Orchard and Farm Market. My wife Joanna and I um, started the business. We actually leased an existing orchard um, for a couple of years when we first got started, and then we uh, the purchased the farm where we uh, where we are now, our home base for for the. Um, for the operation in 2006. Um, three children, uh, our son Jacob um, is 15 and just as an aside, in about two minutes, he's gonna be giving his uh, fruit and vegetable impromptu speech, also virtually uh, in the state FFA uh, impromptu speaking contest. So any uh, any good thoughts for him would be appreciated. I know I'm, my mind's on him a little bit. Uh, we've been practicing speeches for, for a couple of days, having him get ready for that. But um, And then uh, our daughter, Jocelyn, and our son, Joel, uh, help make up the, the family that, that's very much involved on a day-to-day -day basis here on, on our operation. Uh, next slide. So this is our market here on the farm. Um, when we... Uh, we purchased the farm, as I mentioned, in 2006 and, and began this business, and um, we're very fortunate. Um, you know, timing is everything, I think, and um, at the time when, when we were venturing into this, the, the Ag Development Board um, saw fit to have an agritourism program there for a couple of years, and we were uh, able to benefit from that agritourism program and received a $50,000 forgivable loan. Um, to help build this market building and really put us in the position to uh, build more and, and it really was a, a hand up um, to to help us get get the facility that we needed um, to be able to deliver our products to the public and so um, we certainly are are still indebted to um, 
Dag Development Board, Warren and his team uh, for for the great work that they do. Um, the way that forgivable loan worked at the time, we were able to to get credit for products purchased from other Kentucky farmers uh, to earn forgiveness on that loan, um, and, and were able to get all of that forgiven. And so that was a, a big help for us in, in getting our business off the ground. So this is our, our primary market here on the farm. It's surrounded by our orchards and vegetable fields um, and was the primary marketing outlet for our product. Um, up until 2015, if you go to the next slide. Um, in 2015, we were um, presented opportunity to purchase a second location in Elizabethtown. Uh, that business had been there for several years as Three Springs Farm, and it was primarily a um, garden center type business. And we had, um, we had already ventured a little bit into growing some bedding plants and vegetable plants. Um, but this really gave us the opportunity to grow that enterprise. And so um, we, we took that opportunity and purchased that second location um, for two reasons. It, um, it, it, it increased our um, capacity to do flowers and, and plants and those things, but it also got us um, into a, a more concentrated population center for our produce. And it's something that we had talked about uh, trying to venture into the Elizabethtown market because we were already drawing a lot of customers out of Hardin County. Uh, we participated in the Hardin County farmers market. So we had a lot of our people in Hardin County, um, but this really gave us an opportunity to buy into a business that was already there and, and have a good base to start with. So um, it, it greatly increased our uh, plant growing capacity and, and ability um, to sell those products, but it also opened the door for us to sell a lot more of the products that were already part of our mix in terms of produce and, and those things. Uh, next slide. So this is, um, this is kind of our spring season. Uh, it's another picture in the center of the market in Elizabethtown. Um, and then uh, a couple pictures from our greenhouses. We now have six greenhouses here on the farm where we're growing uh, vegetable plants and herbs. Um, we also grow most of the vegetable plants that we grow in our own fields um, for, uh, for our vegetable production, but then also uh, lots of uh, bedding plants and um, hanging baskets and, and vegetables and, and herbs for retail sales. Um, it, it's uh, certainly not probably how we envision things going, but um, we're in a place today where our, our plant business is actually our number one um, gross sales category when we look at look at our sales across uh, across all categories for our business. Next slide. So this is more of our uh, summer mix of products, and we transition away from. Um, plants in the early summer uh, we we do grow about an acre of plastic culture strawberries um, and then we have peaches and um, all together we're growing about 25 or 30 acres of vegetables uh, mostly plastic culture um, but just a wide variety of, of products to last us all through the summer when when we first opened our market uh, back in 2006, we, we had in mind that we wanted to keep expanding and adding products to our mix um, to allow us to be open eight or nine months and really be able to provide that full-time income um, that would allow both John and I to be here on the farm. Um, and we're, uh, we, we have gotten there now. We're, we're open from um, late March up until right before Christmas is our is our marketing season for the two stores. So we've been able to do that. And Joanna has um, been a full time uh, full time partner in the business all along, but she's been full time on the farm now for about ten years. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are some just some pictures from our fall activities. Um, initially, fall was really our, our big season, of course, with the apples and pumpkins and uh, agritourism. With the, the increase in our greenhouse business, we kind of bookend the seasons now with, uh, with a really busy spring season and then lead through the summer um, and then finish up with our, with our fall season. Um, and we don't know how this fall season is, is going to look yet. We're um, trying to um, 
evaluate all that and figure out what it's going to mean um, in terms of school tours. We're not expecting uh, not expecting that to be an option. Um, we have typically done around 2,500, 3,000 school kids uh, a year to come out to the farm and pick a pumpkin and, and learn a little bit about where their food comes from. And um, we're really uh, disappointed that that's probably not going to be an option for us this year because even from the from the very early days of our business, we felt like that was maybe the most important thing that we did was to invite the public and especially kids onto our farm to talk about agriculture and talk about where their food comes from and to hopefully plant that seed of, of what a farmer is and what they do and how important they are to their everyday lives. And so we're we're looking at some ways to, to be able to do that even in this um, COVID situation that we're in. But um, the fall season does focus a lot on families and, and agritourism activities and events that we have, like our uh, hot air balloon event that we do every year in October. Um, so, and we, we joke and say that fall is really the, the fun time around the farm. So um, that's our that's our fall season. Next slide, please. We also have a commercial kitchen on the farm, and we use a lot of our products in those um, in those items. Fruit turnovers in season with the with the different kinds of fruit and caramel apples and uh, pies and those things is, uh, has been a really good way for us to use. Um, products, especially maybe a number two product and add some value to that and um, and deliver a product to our customers. We also partner with several uh, other local farmers and both of our markets have local meat, uh, milk, eggs, cheese, and, and other products available. So we really try to represent um, all of, of our fellow farmers and, and offer lots of Kentucky Proud um, produced items and, and items straight off the farm as much as we can. Uh, next slide. The end of our season is our, our Christmas season. We'll stay open until the 23rd of December each year. Um, and we do live trees and, and wreaths through the Christmas season. Uh, I'm not Kentucky proud on that one yet, maybe someday, but, um, but not yet, but we do a lot of, um, uh, we do a lot of fruit baskets and gift baskets, uh, made up of, of our, um, jar products and other Kentucky Proud items uh, and sell those both to individuals and to businesses, um, deliver some around and then also ship those across the country for um, at Christmas time. So it's a good another good way for us to promote those Kentucky Proud products and other Kentucky farmers. Uh, next slide. So that's really kind of the, the quick version of our farm and, and what we do here. Uh, also wanted to take just a second, I'm currently serving as chair of the Kentucky Horticulture Council. Um, that council is made up of all the member organizations that you see listed here on the right um, and also have contact information there for the organization and for our executive director. Um, our mission from the, uh, the, um, from the council is to promote to promote horticulture and try to advance the cause of, of horticulture crops and producers across the state. And go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. And we're uh, we're stewards of um, several dollars of ag development funds um, that we um, distribute for research projects, both um, through the university system and then also through um, individual farmer uh, research projects that are done um, and then just spend a lot of time trying to promote horticulture whether it be um, the green industry uh, nursery and landscape or through uh, food production so um, just wanted to make everyone aware I guess the the horticulture council is is out there and, and we're trying to do things every day to promote the horticulture industry in the state um, both among our, our peers in the agriculture industry and also in the in the general population so, Tim, again, thanks for inviting me to be on the panel and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Jeremy, thanks so much for the remarks. And I know you've got lots going on there. and appreciate you connecting all the dots with some of your customers and vendors that you work with as well. I'm going to have Shelly bring up a second poll. Uh, one of the things that's been mentioned uh, this morning is the number of people that have received assistance from various programs. Uh, we have a number of state agencies and government uh, folks on the call this morning, uh, whether it's USD Rural Development or uh, the Governor's Office of Ag Policy or KCARD. 
uh, if you could, uh, if you've received benefit from one of these organizations, uh, mark the poll. And then uh, as we are finishing that up, I do remind you, uh, if you have questions uh, related to any of the speakers, uh, please start sending those. And then one of the things that we've been doing when we've done these sessions uh, in person is at the end, we've asked each person to offer a one more summary of what they picked up from the day's session. And so you can go ahead and start uh, submitting those through the chat feature as well. Our next speaker is Dylan Caldwell with uh, Independent Stave and Kentucky Cooperage in Lebanon, Kentucky. And so, Dylan, we look forward to your remarks here shortly. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Again, uh, I am Dylan Caldwell. I manage the uh, seasoning yard and all raw material handling here at Kentucky Cooperage, which is a subsidiary of Independent Stave Company. Uh, Shelly, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, what we do here, we are a family owned operation. Uh, four generations of the Boswell family have propelled us to where we are now, uh, which is operating uh, in the uh, working with uh, the best technology we can to uh, save as much wood as possible. Uh, we are utilizing over 100 plus years of history uh, to craft our world-class barrels. Uh, we are globally known uh, with in over eight countries. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a list of some of the things we offer, uh, spirit wine barrels, uh, oak alternatives, which is things such as sawdust bedding and uh, mulching, uh, log procurement and sales, staves and heading. Uh, next slide, we have a video. Shelly, are we going to be able to play the video? Oak is in our DNA. For five generations, over 100 years, our family-owned company has sourced quality white oak for staves and cooperage. Our knowledge of the forest, the land, and the oak allows Independent Stave Company to build a better spirit barrel. When you begin with high-quality raw material, it carries through to the final product. Our log buyers are the best in the industry at selecting logs to make great barrels. They know how to work with loggers who sustainably manage and harvest the forest, so we will continue to have a great source of oak for generations. At our company-owned stave mills, we process logs into high-quality rough staves, sustainably utilizing 100% of the log Our staves and heading are cut with exact specifications to give our cooperages the opportunity to make world-class oak barrels. Our craftsmen and women are the heart of Independent Stave Company. Their skills, paired with equipment designed by our own engineers, shape the staves into barrels, ensuring quality at every step. Toasting and charring the barrel releases desirable flavors and aromas. We partner with distillers to find the perfect toast and char recipe that will develop specific flavors while aging their unique spirit. Independent Stave Company encourages the relationship between quality craftsmanship and manufacturing and cutting edge science. Our research team pushes the limits on what a barrel can do. We are constantly experimenting to unlock the flavors waiting in the oak. From our classic charred barrel to our innovative small batch series, ISC builds custom barrel programs for distillers who craft the world's finest spirits. Again, that is just a uh, brief overview of our uh, Spirit Barrel brand, uh, what we're all about here. Um, why White Oak, you may ask? Uh, 
white oak has tylosis, which clogs the wood pores uh, and allows that barrel to be liquid tight. Uh, all while being flexible and durable enough to withstand the uh, machining going all the way through the process. Um, along with the, the quality of stave here, we also uh, do deal with the oak chemistry. Uh, we have an R&D department that deals with uh, research each and every day on uh, new flavors and seasoning methods to bring out the best flavors for our customer. Next slide, please. Um, our American white oak does a number of things. Uh, of course, habitat and food for wildlife. Um, we support the rural economy. Um, along with that, uh, there of course, furniture, flooring, chemistry, railroad ties, pallets, um, and of course, the big one, barrels and spirits for wine. Um, this is a map of uh, everything we cover here at ISC. You can go to the next slide. Uh, our log buying network. Um, we have 25 full-time log buyers that cover over 20 states, uh, sourced from over a data from a database of over 4,000 log suppliers. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a slide that shows the uh, the annual hardwood gross. Um, basically, this time right now we have two and a half more. Two and a half times more harvestable white oak compared to 40 years ago. So some people, some people may ask, you know, what, what are you doing with all this white oak? Where are you getting it? Uh, we assure you that the uh, the growth of the forest is being maintained, and uh, it's it's even better now than it was in the past. Next slide, please. Um, we here at Kentucky Cooperage and Independent Stave, we try to utilize each and every part of the log. Uh, as I mentioned before, we offer uh, sawdust. Uh, we work with vendors. They purchase it for things such as animal bedding, uh, wood stove pellets, uh, things of that nature. Um, we have a sister company in Missouri that works with a mulch division uh, for all your landscaping needs. Next slide. Uh, currently in Kentucky, we have three facilities that employ over 500 people. Uh, we are working on a fourth facility in Moorhead, Kentucky, uh, looking to be operational in 2022. Um, it's going to employ over 200 employees. Next slide. Uh, along with all the agricultural business that we are involved in, uh, the bourbon industry also brings a ton of tourism to the state of Kentucky. Um, more than 2.3 billion in capital projects underway and planned by 2022. Uh, this is including new distilleries and aging warehouses. Um, I know personally here in Marion County, we're working on a new, they're working on a new distillery, uh, Diageo. Um, the Bourbon Trail brings multiple, multiple tourism tourists through Kentucky. Um, in 2018, the Bourbon Trail attracted 1 million visits. I know in 2019, 1.7 million people made a stop in Kentucky for the Bourbon Trail. Next slide. Uh, moving forward, uh, basically all we're asking is just for uh, continued education on proper ma uh, management of the forest, uh, proper, proper uh, practices as far as uh, just responsibility on harvesting your white oak. Um, this will help continue the trend on, uh, can help, help it continue to grow into the future. Uh, again, thank you guys for letting me speak today. Um, that's all. Thanks so much, Dylan. Uh, very interesting uh, on how you've connected uh, forest industry to the production side of the spirits as well as uh, using some of the byproducts back for the agriculture sector. We've got a dairy farmer coming up later that may talk about uh, the bedding material. At this time, we go to Connor O'Driscoll, uh, who serves as the fifth master distiller in the 84-year history of Heaven Hill Distillery. And uh, tell us about your company and uh, what you've got going on at Heaven Hill. Well, hi, Tim. Thank you. Um, just a quick point of order. I'm actually the seventh master distiller, but the fifth in the Shapira era. Um, so <laughs> a minor correction there. Um, so like several of the, I think all the, um, all the speakers before me, uh, we are a family owned third generation uh, independent company, been in business since 1935. 
Um, and it's kind of good to see uh, a lot of our partners have already spoken and it's a kind of nice segue in, especially behind Dylan and uh, Independence State there. Um, goes without saying that um, bourbon is a, uh, an agricultural product. I mean, if you think of all our ingredients, uh, water, logs, grain, and even yeast are um, our agricultural products. So we have a very close uh, and deep connection with our, uh, our farmer partners, our Cooper partners, and uh, maintaining those, uh, those connections is, is one of the, actually it's one of the, the most fun parts of this job. Um, looking at each of those ingredients, uh, Warren spoke at the start of the conference about the importance of water. Um, it's no coincidence that, you know, Kentucky is the, the world headquarters of bourbon, and that's due to our, our supply of uh, limestone water. You can't make good whiskey without iron-free limestone water, and that's that's why that's why Kentucky is great for horses and whiskey. It's, it all boils down to the water. Uh, moving on then to logs, um, you know, I won't repeat what uh, what Dylan said, but Independence Dave is one of our one of our biggest and best partners. Um, we they source our wood from Kentucky and all across Appalachia. And on his last slide there, he spoke about the partnerships with the uh, with University of Kentucky, Kentucky Department of Ag. Um, one of the things that, that we're involved with is the White Oak Initiative, and I believe Independence Day are too. And that um, that's uh, a, a industry wide partnership um, looking at sustainability of White Oak. You know, the logs we use for uh, barrels that are typically come from uh, an 80 to 100 year tree. So Heaven Hill has been in business for 85 years. So the, the acorns that fell as this company was founded, we're now turning into barrels. So that gives you some idea of the, of the life cycle we're dealing with. Um, moving on then to grain. Um, all our corn is uh, sourced from about a 50 mile radius, so it really is a local, uh, a local supply chain. Um, we are uh, one of, if not the largest, single site bourbon distillery in the world. Um, some uh, idea of you know, what those numbers mean. Um, we're going to process uh, into whiskey about 4 million bushels uh, of corn, just uh, of corn, the other grains as well, but 4 million bushels of corn that's sourced, like I said, from a 50 mile radius. Um, that equates to about 16,000 acres of just corn, and the average farm size in Kentucky is somewhere in the 170, 180 acre range. So somewhere between 90 and 100 farmers, uh, as it were, rely on just Heaven Hill. Of course, we're only one player in the bourbon industry. Um, but you know, again, the, the close and deep partnership we have with our farm partners. Looking at our other grains, um, the small grains as we call them, wheat and rye, uh, one of the things that sets Heaven Hill apart is, you know, we, we have five distinct mash bills um, and we use uh, corn, rye, wheat and malt barley. Uh, a lot of our wheat does come from Kentucky. Um, we work closely with farmers like Walnut Grove, the Hawker family, Daniel Bowling Green. Um, and we are heavily involved in the project, I think Aaron mentioned it earlier, um, uh, to bring back rye as a Kentucky uh, cash crop. Typically, rye for the last you know, several decades has come from you know, the upper Midwest, the Dakotas, up into Canada, maybe even Europe. But here in the last five years or so, there's been a significant effort to bring uh, rye back as a Kentucky crop. And, Aaron, I don't know if you recognize this, but this is some homestead rye that uh, that we turned into whiskey last year as part of what we call our, our uh, grain to glass project, where we're growing uh, growing some. You know, we have we have some fields down near our headquarters in Bardstown, and we're growing crops there. There's corn growing there right now, hoping to put some rye in this winter. And of course, uh, we grew some wheat there last year. So that's an exciting project. Um, and then kind of to wrap it all up, you know, uh, after we distill the whiskey out of the fermented grains, you know, we, we're, we're left with this product called stillage, the spent grains, we run that through uh, two centrifuges and um, produce uh, a product called wet cake. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really good animal feed. You know, the fermentation process consumes the carbohydrate portion of the grains but it leaves the fibers, the oils, the fats, the proteins, 
and you know after we spin the liquid off it makes a great animal feed and uh and we we partner with purina who distributes that to distributes and sells that to uh, a lot of the, the beef and uh, also the, the um, pork and chicken farmers around the state so kind of start to finish um again to, to i can't stress it enough how how close we partner with uh, our, our farmer partners and how important they are to us and to the bourbon industry and you know we can't make whiskey without you so thanks to the farmers thanks to the coopers and of course thanks to the department of ag for supporting them thanks connor for your comments so uh, last year we entertained a group of usda foreign attaches and they were able to visit your visitor center and you all showed them a great time of hospitality and, and appreciate the support that you've got for Farmers there locally, but also, as you mentioned, uh, start down as Logan County and other parts of the state. Our no, next speaker. Uh, we're, we're just one last thing that we're slowly but surely opening up our visitor centers again. So looking forward to, to hosting people in the, in the near future again. Well, thanks again. And many of us uh, on the call today are native Kentuckians. And you might have noticed uh, that Marion County accent uh, that was influenced by some time in Dublin. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Jamie, and I believe uh, Matt uh, also comes to Kentucky uh, from Illinois. So uh, we're glad to have a few people that uh, settled in God's country uh, for uh, your uh, better part of your career. So Matt, uh, we'll turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about Bourbon Barrel Foods. Sure. Thanks for having me on this call. Um, yeah, I, I was born in Illinois, but I've been here since I was... Uh, I'm nine years old, so I kind of call Kentucky home. Um, did spend some time down in Florida, but like a lot of people uh, that leave the state, they always you know look forward to coming back. Um, you know my my company name is Bourbon Barrel Foods. I, I founded this uh, 15 years ago. I started in my basement doing one product, and that was micro brewed soy sauce, which uh, you know, of the hundred products that we sell now, it's it's still my most popular. Um, you know, it was uh, you know one of those ideas that came and came into my head, and I wasn't quite sure why. But as I researched it and tried to develop this this product, um, I saw a lot of similarities between the brewing of soy sauce and the distilling of bourbon, and not only in process, but also history and heritage of the two products. And I, I saw an opportunity right away where I could market this product um, on the tails of, you know, the growing popularity of bourbon. Um, and so with, you know, our soy sauce, we source our, our beans, which are non-GMO, uh, from a, a local farm about 45 miles uh, south of Louisville. Same farmer also grows our wheat, soft red winter wheat. Um, and when we first started buying from uh, Barnard Peterson, um, it was maybe a tote a year. And now I think we're, you know, taking delivery of, you know, well, not my area anymore, but I, we're, we manufacture just under 10,000 gallons of soy sauce a year and we're growing. Um, you know, it was... Uh, I think early on in these presentations, uh, Dr. Quarles mentioned the affinity that people have for the state of Kentucky. And that's one of the things that I've been able to hang my, my hat on as I travel the world and talk about soy sauce with people. You know, they're always enamored with all those things that Dr. Quarles mentioned. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of food history within this state, and I think that my what my company has done is tried to harness that uh, within a gourmet foods product category. Uh, you know, we we don't just do soy sauce anymore. Um, you know, it's like I said, my most popular product, but you know, we've branched out into uh, different categories: jams, jellies, spreads, preserves. Um, all fruit sourced from within the state of Kentucky. And this is something that, um, you know, we we could have sourced from anywhere and bought it maybe a little cheaper, but it's not how we want to grow our company. Um, the black raspberries come from right around Mount Sterling. The blueberries we buy through the Kentucky Blueberry Growers Association. 
uh, the apple butter uh, is a seasonal item for us. It's extremely popular, but we stop making it as soon as apples aren't available in Kentucky. Um, you know, sorghum, uh, we work with one farmer in Jeffersonville, Kentucky, or Jeffersontown, Kentucky. It's Danny Ray Townsend. And I met Danny Ray about uh, 10, 12 years ago. And I'm not sure he knew what to think of me, um, but he was growing about 40 acres of sorghum at the time, all hand harvested and processed on his farm. So it was a state grown. Um, and now he, last time I talked to him, he has grown almost 150 acres and we were buying pretty much everything that he was growing. So true value added, uh, agriculture with him. And, you know, I, I can't sell my products unless I have good stories to tell. And the state of Kentucky certainly has a lot of those. Um, you know, Allison mentioned the focus on local with, uh, you know, this, COVID-19 situation that we're all in, and that's definitely true. And we've really seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, an increase in in the sales of our products due to that. Um, you know, also uh, tourism that Dylan commented on uh, is very important, and it did not exist uh, when I started my company. 15 years ago. Um, and so I've had a sideline seat watching that grow and, and really witnessed, uh, you know, the, you know, the city of Louisville and the state of Kentucky really push for this tourism with the bourbon industry. And when I was first selling my product, I would visit every single distillery. And, and at one point they all looked very similar. And now each one of them have their own individual home place, which is, you know, you know, it, it uh, has kind of transformed bourbon country into um, what people used to go visit Napa for, for wine. And so it's just been exciting for me to witness that and watch that grow and continue to grow. Um, you know, especially, you know, how I started my company. I'm a blonde haired guy in Kentucky that makes soy sauce, but now we sell what we make to the Japanese. Uh, we export to um, almost a dozen countries now the products that we make. Um, and every time I visit one of these countries, everybody knows the state of Kentucky, which is, which, you know, makes me very proud to be from here. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, the success of my company has been based largely on our innovation, but the success of the bourbon industry. And, you know, it has allowed me to establish relationships with farmers across the state uh, relationships that I never imagined I would have, uh, but are, you know, genuine and, and they, they've lasted, you know, 10 plus years. And even the, the husband and wife that make our jams and jellies, you know, like I said, I could have gone anywhere to have that made. Um, but I believed in them and it was a three year process for them to get, uh, the cane kitchen up and running in, uh, Appalachia and, uh, give them a lot of my support. Hopefully they'll be able to create more and more jobs as we grow that particular product category. Um, you know, we, whereas I started in my, in my basement, I now, uh, my warehouse is about 25,000 square feet. I have three retail stores in Louisville. We distribute all across the country. And like I mentioned, we export, but I also employ 35 people. Um, that are actually the brains of the operation as I do this video call from home. Uh, they are all uh, working hard and making me look a whole lot smarter than I really am. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to continue to grow. And I love the support that the Department of Ag gives us. Uh, the Kentucky Proud symbol has been an important symbol for us. I believe we max out those dollars every single year. And, um, you know, just appreciate everything that everybody's doing for us. Um, so thank you. Matt, we appreciate your comments. And Matt mentioned his involvement with international trade and uh, Connor with the uh, Heaven Hill Distillery. Both of those companies have utilized some programs from the Southern U.S. Trade Association. And uh, we've got a short video that we're gonna uh, pull up now that talks about those programs. And uh, we're fortunate to have a intern, uh, Saxon Marvin, that's working with the Department of Agriculture this summer. 
and uh, she may have contacted several of you uh, related to this program. So, uh, Shelly, if you want to play the uh, the Susta video real quick. Hi, With 95% of consumers living outside the U.S., global trade is the driving force behind growth in U.S. agriculture. So, as a food and agricultural business, how do you get your product from here to there? It may seem overwhelming, but the Southern U.S. Trade Association, in partnership with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, has been helping Kentucky agribusinesses export since 1973. SESTA's programs, created by the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service, help businesses promote their products internationally. Through SESTA's Global Events Program, companies can meet qualified foreign buyers at international trade shows and at trade missions here in the U.S. and abroad. With the 50% Cost Share Program, qualifying companies can receive 50% reimbursement on eligible export promotions, including advertising, exhibiting at international trade shows and related travel expenses, in-store demonstrations, and more. Interested in our programs? Your company just needs to meet a few eligibility requirements. Your company must be export ready and headquartered in the SESTA region. Your products must have at least 50% U.S. agriculture content with a U.S. origin statement on the label. Your products must have a brand name. Getting started is easy. Visit www.susta.org to create your My SESTA account today. And be sure to let us know which program or programs you're interested in. SESTA opens the door to a world of opportunity. Thanks, Shelley, for showing the video. And uh, one of the priorities for Commissioner Quarles is international trade and the uh, discussion on the barrels and oak products, uh, forest products are a significant export from Kentucky as well. And the SUSTA programs are targeted for a very specific type company, but we work closely with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Foreign Ag Service, and so there's other programs for other commodities and products as well. Our last presenter is Denise Jones. Denise is a partner with Coleman Crest Dairy and she also uh, works with the Dairy Alliance and as June being Dairy Month uh, here in Kentucky and across the country, I know she's been a senior this morning. Thank you so much, Tim, and it's truly an honor to get to talk to you today about one of the best industries in Kentucky. I'm a little biased, but I would like to share a little background on how our dairy has uh, became in the industry. Um, I married uh, my husband, Curtis, uh, in 2005, and he had just come back to the farm after going to college. So we've been here farming with his parents for 15 years, and it's all because we want to continue this way of life for our kids. Our oldest daughter, Addison, is seven. Uh, or sorry, 12, and she spends a lot of her time on the farm this summer with her dad. She's really growing and taking a role in stepping up to help out. Uh, our son Isaac is nine. He's learning how to drive tractors and learning how to help and do different jobs on the farm. And then our daughter, Olivia, is four. My in-laws, Stuart and Mary Jones, built Coleman Crest Dairy in 1994 as a way for the family to farm full-time. Dairy was very strong then when they had a great opportunity to buy into a, a herd that was selling locally. Uh, they started milking 75 head and within two weeks they were up to 150. Uh, they built everything themselves uh, from the milk barn to the freestyle barn and all the facilities that we have today. Uh, we really focus on cow comfort and housing and then quality feed as well to make that high quality milk. Today the operation consists of my father-in-law and mother-in-law. And then my husband does most of the crops and work with the heifers. And his brother, Mark, the youngest of seven, uh, he and his wife uh, do the feeding and general herd work with the milk cows. In total, we have about 450 head of Holsteins. We raise all of our replacement heifers here on the farm. And then this year, in an attempt to diversify, we've had some pretty challenging times in agriculture uh, the last two to five years, especially in dairy. So we're raising beef cattle to sell pot loads to finish. So that's a new adventure for us, but those are all Angus. And um, we still continue our dedication to the dairy industry as well. Our milk goes to Borden's. If you've ever seen Elsie the cow on that milk jug, that is in London, Kentucky. And I do wanna say thank you to the Ag Development Fund as well. They have helped us in building hay storage facilities, 
Um, so we can pro provide great quality feed for our cattle, as well as our compost bedded pack barn. Tim talked about that earlier. Compost bedded packs are a great way to utilize all the nutrients we get from our cows and they're perfect for cow comfort. Uh, we built that barn about five years ago and all of the sawdust that we get actually comes from ISC. So thank you all for being located close to us. Now we're in Marion County in Loretto. I failed to say that. Also, about 10 years ago through NRCS, we were able to build uh, stack pads to utilize uh, space to keep our cattle off the pastures when it's wet and we want to conserve all of our soils um, in those pastures to provide great feed for those those heifers as they grow and uh, we've also built numerous ponds and ways to store extra water to sustain our livestock especially in the summertime and um, also water our corn if that is needed in the summer. Uh, Tim touched on National Dairy Month. Uh, this is one of the coolest months for us. It's a little bit different we're not able to celebrate with our traditional events, but I would like to share a couple dairy facts with you all to show how much dairy provides to the Commonwealth. In 2019, we had over $171.4 million in sales in the state of Kentucky. Kentucky's home to roughly 460 dairy farm families, and they, they take care of 50,000 cows. Uh, the average Kentucky cow, in case you want to buy a cow to milk on your own, <laughs> that's about $1,030. And then the top producing counties, number one is Barron County, number two is Logan, and number three is Adair. Uh, the total amount of milk produced in the state was 109 million gallons. Uh, we rely very heavily on fluid milk sales, and uh, we appreciate all the support from people drinking milk and enjoying great dairy products. But I appreciate, again, the opportunity. And if you all have any questions, just let me know. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks, Denise, for doing a great job and for the great partnership uh, with you and the Dairy Alliance and KDDC and, and everybody involved in that industry. At this time, Shelly will bring up our final poll. Uh, we've talked a little bit about COVID. And I know within the Department of Agriculture on the federal side, uh, there's a number of different programs uh, that assist farmers. Uh, we've tried to help promote programs through the Small Business Administration and uh, help connect resources. Uh, Commissioner Quarles and the Department of Agriculture have a COVID resource page on our website. And so if you've uh, benefited from any of the federal programs related uh, to the COVID pandemic, uh, if you could complete this survey. And as Shelly is, is doing that, uh, we also want to recognize a special guest as one of our attendees today is Mary Shellman. Uh, Commissioner had mentioned our interest and in involvement in making Kentucky an ag tech capital uh, of not only the country but of the world. And Mary is leading a, uh, a working group uh, looking at how we can capitalize on our resources and uh, better promote Kentucky as an ag tech area. And so, Shelly, if uh, you have the results of the poll. Very interesting that nobody that's involved in the call has uh, received any of the, the technical or financial assistance uh, through the COVID. Uh, uh, I guess we can look at that a couple of different ways. One, in a positive light that maybe uh, your sector, your specific business uh, has been able to overcome uh, those challenges. We have had a couple of questions that come in and would ask if anybody else has a question, if you could go ahead and submit those right away. And if you could go ahead and start sending those one word descriptors for today's program. Uh, one of the questions was to Dylan. Uh, it was back early during his presentation. And uh, the question was, uh, how has the uh, trade tariffs and or COVID impacted uh, your business? And so if you could address that, Dylan. Um, be all right to do it on video then? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, the COVID, uh, it impacted our business. Uh, it, it, it slowed us down just a little bit, you know, trying to keep our employees safe and uh, doing all the necessary steps to uh, ensure that uh, moving forward with our normal processes every day, uh, of course, uh, we took all the government recommendations. Uh, we've got guards in place throughout the plant uh, in between each individual process. Um, 
we're of course we're checking temperatures, making sure all our employees are safe at work. Um, on my end, uh, the trucking, we did see a slight reduction in some trucking. Uh, it's starting to pick up back now. Um, we're we're starting to see see 20 plus loads of staves coming in on my end each and every day. Um, as far as the outgoing uh, for wine and, and stuff like that, I can't really speak on that. Uh, that's more of our Missouri plant, uh, but I do know there was there was a brief slowdown period for them as well. But everything seems to be picking back up now. Uh, and again, uh, our biggest priority was keeping all our employees safe while at work. Thank you. I know uh, agriculture is a challenging business and, and manufacturing can be as well. One question I would have for all of the panelists and, and whoever would like to respond, how have you dealt with adversity? Uh, what have you done to prepare for it? And how have you overcome it? So uh, any of the panelists that would be willing to address that, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, one one thing we've definitely uh, tried to do is we've stayed more uh, proactive as opposed to reactive. Uh, we've tried to stay on top of everything uh, moving forward. You know, it's it's such an unsure time with the COVID-19 uh, in the day-to-day -day process and day-to-day -day activity of everything. You never knew what was going to happen. So uh, uh, we definitely just tried to stay in the loop on uh, ways to, to prevent it, uh, ways to, to keep everybody safe. And again, uh, I just keep going back to the keeping the employees safe. If everybody feels safe at work, they're definitely going to put out a better product than, than if not. So. Thank you. Jeremy. Uh, Tim, I, I would agree with, with what Dylan said. Our first priority was, was trying to make sure we did the things that we needed to do to keep our employees safe. And it was really a challenge for us being a, a direct retail business to know what to expect from our customers. Um, and so we started out early in the game trying to adapt and be prepared for different options. Um, we had experimented a little bit with um, an online platform to sell our products and um, the situation with with COVID kind of called our hand on that and, and forced us into um, accelerating that a little bit. And, and, and it was a good thing that we did. Um, you know, just that extra extra push helped motivate us to, uh, to set up the online platform, and that worked well uh, for us, especially in the early stages of um, – of the situation we also offered curbside service for those who wanted it and so we really just tried to make the effort to meet our customers where they were comfortable um, and a lot of our especially our flower sales are outside and so people i think felt more comfortable um, and it was, it was interesting to see the the difference between customers and, and everybody seemed a little um their level of comfort was a little different for each person. And so we really just tried to, to set up our markets to meet them where they felt most comfortable and, and deal with the public the best that we could. So I uh, feel like we responded and made things up as we went, like a lot of us did, I think, never having been through anything like this before. But um, we had a good spring and, and a good start to our season. And I think a lot of that's because we were responsive and tried to, to just meet our customers where they felt comfortable. Any of the other panelists would like to respond to that? Yeah, just jump in real quick there. Um, you know, the I like what uh, the previous two speakers said about uh, responding to COVID. You know, we had to, we shut our visitor centers down. We pivoted to making um, hand sanitizer at our Canadian, Texas, and uh, Bardstown, and another location in Louisville. So that was a an opportunity to kind of give back to our community as well. But you know, in the in the, the grander scheme of things, Heaven Hill is is no stranger to adversity. I mean, we've survived fires, wars, and now pandemics. I mean, almost all four horsemen of the of the apocalypse. But uh, you know, it's again, it, I think it's a testament to being you know independent, family owned. Uh, we have that ability to be to, to pivot quickly, to be nimble, and to you know to um, to, to play to our strengths. And uh, you know we've we have a, just such a great team, such a great uh, leadership team. The family are amazing and uh, allows us to, like I said, to, to thrive through adversity. Thank you. I see Matt again. Hey, um, yeah, to pretty much what Connor said. Um, you know, I think uh, when this first started. You know, 
there's a, a great community within the state of people that have lived through a whole lot more than my young company has. And so I reached out to them and for a little bit of direction. And so our plan was to innovate, evolve, and be ready for when this ends. Um, we saw a lot of the same changes in our business that everybody else did. Um, remained positive and um, I think coming out of it, uh, like Connor said, with uh, the sense of community and giving back, uh, it's something that we will, you know, we've, we've done in the past, but we will put a, a stronger focus on that uh, going forward. Um, and, you know, hopefully never have to live through something like this again. Um, my staff is, you know, one thing I've realized is that uh, there's a lot that can get done when you're at home. Absolutely. Any of the other panelists on that one? If not, uh, we're going to go to Allison. Allison, there's a couple of questions related to uh, the current interest in local products. And uh, do you think that uh, the increased interest in buying local meat, is that going to be sustainable or is it a, a temporary uh, spike because of limited availability and some of the concerns of rationing? Well, I think that that the interest in it will continue. I, I really do. I think that um, people, they went to Walmart, they went to Kroger, and there was no meat there. So um, I think that was scary for a lot of people. Um, I mean, we saw panic buying. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that this will, like I said before, I, I think people had to kind of reconnect with where their food comes from. And I do think that that is something that will continue. I mean, obviously, you guys know this, um, you know, that because you're doing the, you know, meat processing investment program, the challenge is, you know, a, a facility like ours, we can only do so much. I mean, it's not even comparable to what big meat processors do. I mean, so far from being comparable. So it, it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, that part of our business, it's a hard business. I mean, We've got regulatory and, you know, I know everybody here has got some of that. I've got a USDA inspector who's in my plant five days a week, eight hours a day. Um, so th there are challenges there. And I think uh, there's high barriers to entry to this business as well. You've got to know what you're doing. It's expensive to get started. Um, and I think, you know, you guys are doing a lot to try to um, push people in that direction to get plants like ours to expand capacity. But it's not going to be a quick process to increase that capacity. So I think there's still gonna be some um, some barriers to growth there, at least in the short term, until we can get um, get those investments made. And we're doing it now. I mean, we're, we made some very big investments to try to increase our capacity. We appreciate everything all of the panelists are doing to help connect different sectors of agriculture. And today uh, was just a, a small example of how that works and in, in many cases the company has to be proactive the farmer has to be proactive but uh, we want everybody that's participating today to know that the department of agriculture uh, warren's office with the governor's office of agricultural policy we're available we have a, a number of staff members dedicated to various aspects uh, whether it's kentucky proud whether it's the promotional grant program the buy local program uh, these resources are available to help make these connections and interactions easier. And a lot of times we don't know about the opportunities or the needs uh, from the manufacturers. And that was part of the purpose of putting these programs together four years ago is so that uh, we would have individuals around the state that are helping identify these opportunities and connect those dots. And, and we definitely appreciate the partnership with Lee and his staff and uh, the effort that Shelly and all of the, his team have put together in helping get today's program uh, going. Uh, we've got six more of these. Uh, we're hoping that some of those will be in person. One of the biggest disappointments of going to the virtual is uh, we would be getting ready to adjourn for a really nice Kentucky Proud meal right now. and. Jeremy uh, sort of tempted you with those beautiful strawberries and, and different uh, vegetables and, and fruits that uh, he was showing from his farm. Uh, the next best thing is those of you that participated today, 
will be getting a gift certificate to Booth over the next few days. And so uh, we, we can't feed you today, but hopefully over the next few days, uh, you'll be able to go uh, to Boone's and, and pick up uh, some steaks or burgers or uh, bacon, whatever uh, your preference is. And uh, we appreciate the ability to do that, utilizing some of the ag development funds uh, for today's program. Uh, do any of the other panelists have any uh, closing remarks or any questions uh, that you all would like to ask? If not, uh, Commissioner had to jump off. Normally, he likes to take a few minutes and uh, just reiterate some of the information that was shared during today's session. Uh, the economic contribution uh, that agriculture and manufacturing makes to the state. Uh, we've got over 70,000 jobs in different types of agriculture and natural resource-based manufacturing around Kentucky. Uh, whether that's wood products, uh, meats, uh, other food production, beverages, dairy. And so uh, this relationship and the continuation of these discussions is important. Lee, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Hey, thanks, Tim. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I talked at the beginning of the program about uh, the value and the importance of manufacturing to the state of Kentucky. Um, to wrap up, I want to state that uh, CAM, uh, Kentucky Association of Manufacturers, is uh, the trade association that represents manufacturers for the state of Kentucky. Uh, for those of you that uh, consider yourself in the manufacturing industry, uh, we fight for you. Uh, those of you who don't consider yourself in the manufacturing industry but still are, we fight for you as well. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we uh, advocated very heavily for uh, uh, the uh, establishment of all manufacturers and the entirety of their supply chain and inputs to be determined as essential critical. Uh, and thus, like ag, uh, we kept going and we kept producing and making during the uh, uh, shutdown. Um, you all were growing and, and, and processing food to put on shelves and we were delivering uh, toilet paper that we made and, you know, pencils and laptop computers and all sorts of other things too. So. Uh, once again, our two industries kind of saved the economy. Uh, it had, had we shut down and you shut down, uh, it would have been catastrophic. Um, we, uh, we do a number of things. I mentioned advocacy as a trade association. That's sort of first and foremost of what we do is we advocate for our industry. Um, one particular thing I want to mention before we wrap up is uh, we recently rebooted a long time um, product of the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers. It's our wage and benefit survey. Uh, we've been doing this since the 40s. I've got these amazing leather-bound ledgers from the 40s in our office library uh, from, from back in the day when we were doing that survey. Uh, the 2019-2020 just came out uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, those of you that are looking at your employment status and what you pay and what your benefits packages are and, and how competitive you are, this is a great product for you to kind of look at. Uh, because of the uh, pandemic, uh, we are instigating our next round of data collection starting in August. So we'll have a pre-pandemic report, and then in October, we'll have a 2020 uh, uh, wage and benefit survey, which will kind of give you an idea of what things are like during the pandemic. Uh, 2021, hopefully, we'll, we will be exiting that. We'll have a new set of data to look at, but uh, uh, we are... Um, focused as an organization on advocating for our manufacturers and makers in the state and our processors, uh, helping uh, provide opportunities for connectivity like land and other events that we do, uh, and member benefits. Uh, we have an, an amazing uh, healthcare association healthcare plan. We have uh, um, uh, a number of new insurance products that are coming online that uh, save you a lot of money or in some cases pay a dividend, which are, are great too. A lot of educational opportunities as well. So, uh, our organization is uh, uh, is a nonprofit. We're uh, strictly funded by our membership. Uh, if this is something that is of value to you, we would love to talk to you about uh, how we can help you. Thanks again for uh, being part of this land uh, program. Uh, we hope that you'll join us for the next one if you've got the time and, and learn about more of uh, Kentucky's uh, producers and growers and makers. 
And uh, Tim, great job moderating as always. Appreciate it, Lee. And hopefully everybody noticed under the drop down menu, uh, we do have some handouts, uh, that some brochures about the different programs that CAM offers, as well as the benefits of being part of the Kentucky Proud program, uh, the uh, SUSTA information. Our next forum is July 7th. It was intended to be at the Ashland Community College in Grayson, Kentucky. Uh, we have converted that one to a virtual series as well. And so that one will be July 7th. Uh, we'll have a number of speakers from Northeast Kentucky uh, talking about their interrelationship between agriculture and manufacturing. We would ask a favor if you enjoyed today's program, please help us get the word out. Uh, we appreciate mm -hmm. the time of all the panelists and these meetings uh, take some planning and takes a couple of hours of time for a busy schedule of uh, some busy people. And so part of the purpose of this is to equip each of you with good information that you can share to your Rotary Club, your local elected officials, and even more important than uh, you sharing it is if they participate and they hear firsthand the importance that these industries and these business people bring to their community, not only from an economic standpoint, but you noticed many of the speakers talked about uh, their investment in youth and their investment in philanthropic organizations in their community. And so we definitely appreciate each of you that's participated today. We appreciate the partnership uh, with many of the other service providers. And uh, we are finishing uh, a couple of minutes early. So any last remarks? If not, uh, we will close it down. And then say a special thanks again to Boone's for uh, working with us on the gift certificate. Everyone will be hearing uh, about that soon, but it's $20. Uh, so that it'll be good for uh, uh, a nice purchase. Uh, thanks again to uh, Kentucky Proud and the K Kentucky Agricultural Development Fund and Kentucky uh, Ag 365 for the sponsorship. Tim, thanks to you and your staff for uh, helping put this together. Special big, big thanks to Shelly for running the show. She's the man behind the curtain or woman behind the curtain that makes this go off as flawlessly as it has. Uh, and the rest of the team here at camp for, for doing that as well. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate your uh, participation. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye.